Hello and welcome to another special episode of the Sales Operations Demystified podcast. We're joined by Joe Gelata. Um, now, Joe has extensive experience both in sales and revenue operations, especially at a company that I that we're currently using here, Evster from Vidyard. Um, he's also created something called the Revenue Operations Group, which I want to dig into as well. Um, Joe, welcome to the show. Great, thanks a lot. I appreciate being here. Um, so we'll kick off with the first question. How did you yeah. initially get into either sales or revenue operations? I'm not actually sure where you where your entrance was. Did you start with sales operations and then move to revenue operations, or how did that work? Uh, I kind of fell into the operations side, really. Um, so when I first started my career, I started as a BDR. Um, so actually trying to trying to make something happen with the business and generate some leads and some pipeline and whatnot. Uh, and yeah. then uh, it was actually a really cool company, uh, Sybase, which is now part of SAP. Um, but back then, they they had a really great engine. Um, so kind of had a really good structure of what I think a lot of companies are trying to build today. So I kind of had the advantage of learning in a really nice environment. Um, but I, I found that I wasn't, uh, my path wasn't sales. I didn't have the charisma and the personality to to do that. Um, oh, gee, I don't say that. <laughs> but definitely on the uh, the operations marketing side, kind of the, the back office stuff to make that, to, to support the sales reps and whatnot. Uh, that's where I, I found myself drawn to. Uh, so I ended up going into marketing there. And then as I was in marketing, I had a lot of trouble getting things done. And basically the discovered the reason was that there's not really a lot of operational support. Um, so for the particular group I was in within Sybase didn't have an ops team. Um, so I was sort of just thrust into that role. Uh, myself and, and one person in finance really took over administration of the CRM. And uh, we ended up getting a marketing automation system, which at that time... Um, was was really early stuff, and uh, but at the same time we had some operations people uh, in kind of Sybase Global who were really strong that I could learn from. Um, so that that was kind of my first foray into it, uh, and then from there I went into another company, a smaller company, and um, kind of the same thing happened. Started off on the marketing side, and then ended up creating a, a sales and and marketing operations role. Um, I said they should call it revenue operations. Um, this is before it ever was a thing. And they said, that's the dumbest idea they ever heard. Uh, yeah. So we, we just called it marketing and sales ops. <laughs> and then, uh, but it worked out great. It really helped align the teams. Um, and then from there, I went on to uh, consulting uh, for some large enterprise uh, technology companies. And, and that's where it was kind of the, the real push in operations. So I was able to see that this, gap between sales and marketing was was massive, especially in these big, big companies. Um, could probably get into some cool war stories about that. Uh, but what came out of that is that um, when I got you know, burned out by the consultant life, I went and started working with Vidyard as a very small startup. And as we, we grew, well, first the product and then started a formal marketing and demand gen team, um, we saw the same thing happening with lack of operational support. Um, so my team kind of informally within demand gen, we, we grew an operations team and then eventually it got to the point where we had to break it out as a formal rev ops team. Um, and then they let me name it a rev ops team at that point, uh, which was exciting. I mean, it was very foresight for you on the rev, rev ops team because when did you mm -hmm. initially propose that? Oh, sorry. What was that? When, when did you initially propose like the revenue operations name of the team before Vidyard? Like how, how many years back was that? Um, this is probably going back about 10, 12 years now. Cool. Um, yeah, nice. they thought it was a little too finance sounding, yeah. but at, uh, at Vidyard, it seemed to make sense. So we could we could potentially name you the, the godfather of revenue operations. <laughs> I'll take it. That might be a big claim. But <laughs> <laughs> um, awesome. So, yeah, I think most people I speak to, they, they're in a different role, whether that's finance, whether that's admin or whether that's sales, and then they, they, they seem that they have some kind of proficiency for operations. And then they get right. dragged in. Is, is that exactly. essentially like a summer? Yep. Yeah, it was a little push and pull, I think, personality-wise. And, and just my my beliefs and, and what I enjoy doing lends itself to operations. Um, but there was yeah. always such a strong demand that it was just, it was easy to basically do what I wanted and, and find a place to do it wherever I went. So. Got it. Um, I'd like to dig a little bit more into the video journey. You, you, you were there mm -hmm. for a number of years, right? And you said you joined yep. at a very small startup. Um, at the starting point, what was the number of, resources in revenue operations versus the number of sales reps and then at the point that you left what was that those numbers as well yeah so i started at the company around 10 people uh, i think we we formalized the demand gen team at about 30 people 
uh, and had, I would say maybe about half of a person dedicated to the operations side at that point. Um, at the point where we formally broke it out as its own team, uh, we were around 100 people, um, maybe combined 15 BDRs and sales reps. Uh, nice. And we started the team with, uh, I believe, three people. Yeah. Um, so one, uh, one on the tools and systems, one on uh, data and analytics, uh, and then myself leading the team and really focused on the overall process and whatnot. Got it. Um, and what was the, the tech stack that you were using as you left? So Vidyard was a Salesforce shop. Um, started with part out on the market automation side and then eventually moved to Marketo. Um, obviously a, a huge consumer of the Vidyard <laughs> tool itself and go video. Uh, so that was always at the core of the outbound strategy. Um, we dabbled with a couple different data tools, uh, trying to get you know different leads and, and lists for the, the marketing and sales team. Uh, sales Loft was another one we used on the outbound, um, for the outbound cadences. Um, we got into, in the later years, got into a lot more BI tools. Uh, so Full Circle Insights was something that we plugged into Salesforce to generate data and get us some base reports. And then after that, we took it a step further and got Periscope data uh, as a BI tool to put over top of that and all of our other systems and, and start to build some holistic dashboards across the business. Uh, I think those are kind of the main ones that we used. Got it. Um, and now I want to shift to your managing the relationship between you, yourself and the operations team and the actual sales reps. So mm -hmm. what, what kind of advice do you have to give to try and get these people who are quite different creatures <laughs> to operations people on your side to do the things you want them to do with us, a new tool or process? Yeah. Yeah, I think there is probably two ways to approach it. Um, one is to kind of force them to do the things that need to be done that they don't want to do. Um, you know, I mean, we have to forecast whether they want to put things in the CRM or not. Uh, so there's always kind of this balance of you're, you're getting a base salary and, you know, please just update it. Um, but the flip side of that is you have to make it as easy as possible to do that. So remove all barriers. Uh, actually, in uh, my current role here at ClearPath and Auto Motors, and we're going through a, a massive simplification of our entire revenue um, and bookings generation system. Uh, so really just scaling back the CRM and, and removing all those barriers. Um, where in some cases we have to make sacrifices on the data that we gather and, and what we can use to make decisions. But at the end of the day, if that data isn't being put in because it's too difficult, it, we're no further ahead. Um, so we're really trying to make it as easy as possible to, uh, you know, for the reps to, to use the systems. Um, and I think just maintaining a close relationship with with the reps. Uh, you know, we've we've all got pains and we can relate re relate to those. Um, and you know, just building those personal relationships. Obviously, it gets a little more difficult as the team gets larger. Um, right now, we have the benefit of, of having enough reps that, you know, we all know each other on a name-by-name -name basis and, and can go out for lunch and things like that. But, you know, a year from now, that, that certainly won't be the case. And um, I think the key there is to kind of pick the key influencers, um, which is actually something we've done with the simplification where we've added a, a new tool that we think is going to make it easier to enter data into the CRM. Yeah. And what we're doing is we're giving it to one of the most influential reps um, who has the biggest challenge with this. And the theory is if we can get them to, to use this and be successful with it and, and like it, um, they're going to be able to spread that word around the, the rest of the sales team. Um, and, you know, they're not just taking it from the ops folks. It's coming right from a sales rep who's doing it. Um, so that, that's really important, I think, is that a personal touch. Got it. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, and then the, the, the other two different parties that you've had to bridge in your career are the, sales and the marketing teams um do you have any advice on navigating the incentives and the the goals of both of those yeah that's uh, a challenge i think as the company gets bigger um in, in the early days i've always found it it's kind of worked itself out um because those teams are so close and, and really i mean you're just trying to keep the lights on at that point so no one cares who's generating leads as long as money's coming yeah. out uh, but obviously, as it gets larger, there's you know, start to try to optimize things and then look at where you know where's the lead coming from, and people start fighting over it. Um, I think from the operations side and, and being a neutral party between both groups, they're usually both right when they make a claim. Um, so I kind of have to be the referee in many cases, and 
and you usually propose a new model of maybe it's not a single lead source that we need to look at its influence on both sides and, and things like that, yeah. um, which creates more work for my team because we have to build those models and whatnot. Um, but at the end of the day, I think, you know, if, if there's somebody to, to focus on bringing them together, you can get a better, um, more usable outcome, um, you know, better data for making decisions um, and, and try to align them as well. So to do that, uh, personalities, I think, unfortunately, play the biggest role in those gaps. Um, you know, there's situations and well, clear path is, is one right now where, you know, personalities and egos don't get in the way. So it's very easy to, to referee marketing and sales. Uh, whereas in past companies, um, you know, there's a personality on one side or both sides uh, that is more I guess, power hungry and um, career hungry than they are worried about the success of the company. Uh, and well, to be quite honest, I haven't figured out how to, <laughs> how to referee those games yet. Um, but uh, yeah, you know, you really have to spend time on bringing those people together. Um, and I think, you know, simple things like just opening up meetings to both sides. Uh, you know, we have, we have front end business meetings. We don't have marketing meetings and sales meetings. So when decisions are made on one side, the other party's there to hear it and understand it. And, you know, they can raise a, a hand if there's a red flag that they see. And um, otherwise you're getting buy-in from both sides at the same time at the point those decisions are being made. Uh, so just open communication is, is key. Got it. Yeah, I think having a what did you call it? The front end teams meeting, front end. Yeah, so we're in a hardware business here, uh, so you know usually we'd call it a a revenue operations meeting or a pipeline right. meeting or something like that. But here we tend to divide the business into to front end kind of business, marketing, sales, generating mm-hmm. customer, and back end uh, operations and manufacturing of actually delivering the uh, the products to the customer. Um, so that's the, yeah, the front end is where where sales would sit. Got it. The revenue team. I, exactly. It's like there's this, there's this artificial line drawn between sales and marketing back when business was slightly different. But now, especially in the SaaS yeah. world, um, we're coming to realize that actually there is so much blurred, more blurred than we thought it was, and <laughs> actually having a revenue team. Revenue team yeah. doing things. So, um, anyway. Yeah, I love the concept of a CRO. I think a lot of times it's really just a VP of sales that, that has a C title, which is unfortunate. But when you do get someone who, who, who truly appreciates marketing and sales and can really be a true CRO, uh, that's, it's phenomenal to watch. Um, you know, at Vidyard, we had Steve Johnson, who he was COO, but essentially was a CRO role and yeah. totally bought into both worlds and aligned things. And um, it was just wonderful to watch. And obviously they're, you know, they're seeing success from that. So. Well, was his background primarily in sales or marketing or both? Mine was in marketing. Um, well, a little bit on the BDR side, um, but then I came in and, and did much more on the marketing side. Um, so, sorry, were you asking about myself or Steve? Uh, but, but, both. But. Yeah, Steve was kind of all over the place. Um, probably more sales, I think. Um, but when I worked with him, he'd been a COO for so long that I think. He was just running everything, so <laughs> he just you know was focused on success of the company. That was the that was the goal. So. Yeah, um, and can we talk about the, the forecasting process of so your current role? Um, what's your involvement in that, and what what does the process look like in forecasting? So we yeah. do kind of two um, two things. So we do short term forecast, where the uh, the reps will have a, a it's a commit category essentially or. Uh, closing category where they can commit deals that you know have a certain probability of or they feel have a certain probability of closing and there's a few different categories there um, and then we'll just really look at deal by deal what's in commit um, and what do we think is going to close this quarter uh, beyond that we don't use that that field and, and that forecasting model um, that's when we start to break down averages and whatnot uh, so we've got a model where we look at the the pipeline or each deal where it, where it's scheduled to close um, how much the deal is for and what stage it's at. And so each stage will have its own probability of, of when. Um, and then based on the date it's scheduled to close, we, we kind of we sum everything up and then we have a, a push uh, factor. So we'll add up the total weighted pipeline for a particular quarter and then we might push 40% out uh, or say 30% out to the next quarter and then 10% out to two quarters ahead and only to keep 60 within that. Um, so we kind of, 
we look at both the win rate and the uh, the timing of it, um, and then we use uh, a staggered <coughs> excuse me a staggered chart to to track month over month how accurate that forecast has been, and then we can make improvements to it. So if we see that um, you know, conversion rates are, are the factor at a particular state, we'll have to you know, fix that that particular uh, criteria. Um, or if we're pushing or deals at a higher or lower rate, then we'll modify that. And um, so far, it's it's been really really useful to kind of break apart that in quarter and out of quarter forecasting uh, to get the, the total picture. Um, usually, they tend to line up quite well. Um, and then for us being a hardware manufacturer, we we don't just look at the dollars. Uh, that's probably less important to us. Really, um, we're we're looking at the number of units. Um, so we start to break down. You know, of the, the major products, how many we're going to have to make, and and then that feeds into the whole production plan of when do we need to start building things. And because unfortunately, you can't build a robot overnight when the deal closes, and as things start to, to grow for us, um, you know, we need to be able to manage that that scaling factor as well on the manufacturing side. Yeah. Um, so that uh, that's critical for us. That's been a, a huge eye opener for me coming into the the hardware world out of out of SaaS, where um, you know SaaS. You, this is oversimplifying it, but you press a button, copy software, and then send someone in to install it and <laughs> yeah. you go through that process and you can scale that team quite quickly. Whereas on the manufacturing side, um, you know, you need at a minimum three months lead time um, before you can deliver things. So and we're yeah. not at a point in our evolution where we can afford to have $20 million of inventory sit on the shelf or get behind on $20 million of products. So that's been a huge focus for us. Yeah, that must add a whole another level of complexity into that sales process. Um, mm -hmm. You mentioned a couple there. From your like over a decade of experience, I believe, um, what do you think has been the most insightful metric to track? Which Salesforce dashboard do you most look forward to re refreshing? For me, I love the funnel. So looking at um, every stage of the funnel, getting as granular as we can to look at the conversion rates between each stage. Uh, the velocity, I think, is kind of the the one that people don't look at it as much as they should because it's hard to track um, with, with most CRMs. Um, but I think those two factors, um, you know, conversion rate and, and velocity, and then obviously layering on the, the volume of, of records and deals and at each stage, uh, those are really cool. Um, we found a really cool tool at Vidyard called Full Circle Insights that allowed us to track that at a really granular level. And the nice thing about that is we can actually start to split it up. So we can look at what does the funnel look like in a certain industry or by a certain lead source, by a certain rep, and all kinds of different things, whatever field information we have in our, our CRM. Uh, so that's been really insightful where if something starts to go off the tracks, we can quickly narrow in on exactly where that is. You know, is that a certain BDR team that, that is having difficulty? Is it inbound, outbound, things like that? Uh, so that, that one has always excited me. Um, I've always focused a lot on pipeline growth. So yeah. the growth rate of, you know, we grew 10% last month, but we grew again this month, but it was only 2%. You know, that is that a leading indicator of some trouble down the road? And then you can start to look at that. So that's that's always a big one. Um, here we, we, we look at bookings, revenue, and also pre-bookings. Um, so we're, as we sign... <laughs> promises of, of future deals um you know we kind of count that as pre-bookings and then we've got our regular bookings and then because of the manufacturing and hardware end of the business we can't actually recognize that revenue until a later date so we kind of look at that whole funnel of getting to revenue not just getting to the deal um, and then some typical stuff like acquisition cost and average deal size and quota attainment make sure that the reps are are being successful um, one area we, we spend a lot of time looking at is onboarding for the reps because we're we're growing quite quickly. So we want to make sure that that's optimized. Um, and that's something that went through it at my last couple of gigs and, and Vidyard probably actually had the strongest focus on that uh, and looking at those metrics. So looking at how, how quickly can reps get on the phone, talking to customers and, and start prospecting, how quickly can they get the first deal? Um, Right now, we're looking at how quickly they can get to our target average deal size. Um, so not just hitting quota or or getting a deal, but actually you know consistently starting to hit that that average deal size. Um, and then on the back end, we also look a lot at dead reasons. So if we're killing deals, why are we killing them, and how can we feed that information back into the rest of the organization, you know, into the product team or marketing team, and and, and the rest of the sales and BDR team to 
try to pivot and, and figure out the best way to go to market. Got it. That was, that was an extremely comprehensive review. <laughs> um, final question. Actually, an ultimate question. What was the ramp time for a new SDL, BDR, and VDR approximately? Twice as long as we expected. Um, <laughs> it, I'm trying to think. It's going back a couple of years now. Mm. I feel like we were shooting for two months and it was more like four to six. Yeah. Um, one interesting thing I've found at every company I've been at is that the first one to three BDRs are really good. Uh, I think it's just a mindset coming in and knowing you're the pioneer and you're figuring out this market. Mm. Um, they just grind and they figure out a way. After that, once you get into the larger teams, um, we've always seen a dip in conversion rates. Um, and I think it's partially because they don't have the same mindset coming in. They're not as gritty and, uh, you know, they kind of assume that the, the trail's already been blazed and, and they expect to be given that path. Uh, I think the other piece of it is that when you're going from you know, three to five BDRs, you probably aren't in the stage yet where you put a focus on enablement um, and you just kind of assume that people will figure stuff out and they obviously don't. Um, so I think that's that's kind of the time where you really need to nail down your onboarding process and get things documented and, and understand that tribal knowledge is not going to scale at that level. And, and you know, you've got to put it on paper if you want people to learn. Um, so, you know, the last organization I was at, we had a phenomenal enablement person and we were able to really tighten up that, that ramp time. Uh, and she was able to, uh, you know, develop a really good program, um, implement a lot of different tactics. And I think the key thing she did that, that I haven't seen a lot of other people do is that she didn't focus on delivering information to people. She focused on them consuming it. Mm -hmm. uh, so as an example, uh, she ran the, the weekly sales huddle and actually she broadened it out to the whole organization where marketing was in there and all of our CS reps. And so it was really um, front end uh, enablement, not just sales enablement. Um, but if somebody was going to go and present a, a new product feature or product or something like that, uh, she didn't just say, here's your 10 minutes, go do your presentation. Uh, she put you through the ringer and she trained you on how to speak to the reps and, and, and spent the time to make sure that that 10 minutes was actually going to deliver value to them. Nice. Um, and people came to those meetings. You know, it was a, a 100%, you know, Friday afternoon, 100% um, attendance every time because people knew that their time wasn't going to be wasted. They were going to walk yeah. away with things they needed. So um, so that was, that was absolutely critical to to tightening the ramp time and then just that ongoing learning over the long run. Got it. Um, and final question, who uh, in your career has inspired you the most regarding revenue operations specifically? Um, there's a lot. Um, I think I mentioned before, Sybase had a very cool um, and well-structured engine, especially for, I mean, that's 15 years ago. Um, and I think, John Chen and Raj Nathan uh, were kind of the guys behind that. And they had a, a whole team that, that worked with them to, to build that out. Uh, and this is long before I even got to Sybase. Uh, so that was really inspiring for me to, to have that framework and understanding of, of how that all should fit together. Um, and a lot of those guys are now at uh, what's left of BlackBerry and, and kind of building that back up. So that they're in town here. So it's kind of interesting to watch, you know, that, that team of, ninjas kind of go in and, and turn these companies around just operationally by looking at the processes and how everything fits together. Um, so when you get into kind of revenue operations specifically, um, I worked with a couple of really good people early in my career. Um, Kristen Roberts was at Sybase and, and Jocelyn Brown's another one who, uh, she was at Eloqua at the time, but um, we, we partnered with her at Sybase. Um, they're now at Salesforce and Allocadia. Uh, but just brilliant minds um, really got the whole picture and and um, are able to tie it all together, um, which I think is kind of the goal of operations, you know, pull people out of that sales focus and help them understand how every, you know, that sales piece ties into the whole organization. A um, couple other like more sales focused people, um, Mike Denemy, who worked with me at my, my last role. Um, he's at Shopify now, uh, just a brilliant sales mind. Um, and then our, our VP of sales, Marty, here at, uh, at ClearPath is, is phenomenal. Um, probably the only VP of, of sales that I've ever worked with that knows more about Salesforce than, than me for sure and, and you know, can go toe-to-toe -to -toe with, with the rest of my team that's focused on that stuff. Um, and then also understands, I mean, he's got 30 years of sales experience, understands everything. Um, so that, that's always great to be able to, 
work with a sales VP that understands the operational side just as well as we do. So it yeah. makes, makes it easier. So yeah, there's a, a lot of great people floating around out there that, uh, that I've learned from over the years. Uh, so there we go. Joe Gilata, the godfather of revenue operations. Um, <laughs> the, the things I really liked. Um, actually, the thing you said right at the end about how operations is the goal is to tie things together and bring people out of sales and to almost educate them about how what they're doing ties in with the rest of the business. Um, the, your, your thoughts on sales versus marketing or your tips on how to bridge that together and just actually having one team, I thought it was really useful. And then the other one, oh yeah, your, your response to my metrics question was incredible. I think you've got like 13 metrics in there. So I'm actually going to go back and then go through them and then we'll, we'll try and list them out on the page below the video. Um, Probably but yeah. the iceberg too. <laughs> <laughs> but Joe, um, thanks so much for your time. That was incredibly valuable. Um, hey, my pleasure. Thank you.